what it is about Gracie Mansion. All I have to do is drive through the gates. And I'm excited. <laughs> well, of course, it's the inner sanctum of the city. For political creatures, anyway. Like us. Mm-hmm. You know what's lovely? I enjoyed myself tonight, and you didn't think that was the least bit awful of me, and that is so nice. Now, Bill would have hated for you to mourn him by going into hiding. Everyone at that party was... Well, they were so full of memories and stories about him. It was his party, too. It certainly was. And that's thanks to you, my friend. That was a lovely speech. Ah, I'm glad. I'm glad. I just kept telling myself that I was talking to Bill Woodard's friends instead of a room full of famous names, and, well, that seemed to help. Frank, you weren't nervous. Oh, well, wasn't I? <laughs> oh, it didn't show. Do you know the mayor said to me that you were one of the most relaxed, natural speakers he'd ever heard? Yeah, he said something like that to me, too. <laughs> Fortunately, I was sitting down at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sit again. I have even more compliments to pass on. I don't want you to keel over onto my floor. <laughs> you can stay, can't you? I do have lots of nice things to tell. Sure. Miriam, hi. I, uh, I have some things to pick up. Sure, Doctor. Come on in. I have them all ready for you. Right in there. Oh. Well, thank you. I didn't expect that. Uh, Jillian asked me to pack them for you. She isn't home yet. Yeah, well, just as well, I guess. Is he all right? Oh, yes. He slept right through supper. And nothing or no one could wake him until he is ready. So now you're raring to go, huh, Tiger? Is it all right if I say hello? You'd be miserable if you didn't. Hey. Hey, big fella. Huh? This is a very late hour for you to be having your dinner. It is sleepy poo time. Huh? You're gonna cooperate, aren't you? You know, he did the same thing last week. We put him in his crib. He went right to bed. He was perfectly happy. Hmm. Well, I figure all he needs is a few toys. He'll play right through. <laughs> Until he gets sleepy. Edmund's wonderful like that. Yeah, he really is, isn't he? Yes, you are. Hello? Zero seven. Mm. Oh, do you believe that wind? Mm, it wasn't so oh. good. Oh, it was hideous. Come on. <laughs> now stop that. Stop what? Oh, it's thawing. <laughs> Are you sure that Jack didn't slip you something a whole lot stronger than wine? Mm -hmm. I just get very silly when I feel good. Terrible nuisance. <laughs> Lucky for you, I like it. Hmm? Well, hmm. I can't get over Jack and Mary and Ryan all cozy and smiling at Wee Hawkins Street. It's so beautiful. Uh, to me, anyway. To me, too. I never realized how much I needed to visit them. And where would I put these? Uh, over, over that chair is fine. Well, now, let's see. There's enough coffee and tea for sure. There may be enough milk for hot chocolate, and there's some beer. But you're probably too cold for that, right? Ah, uh, beer would be grand. <laughs> right. There's some clean glasses over on the counter. You too? If you can live dangerously, so can I. We'll have tea later. Ugh. I don't live dangerously, you know. As a matter of fact, I make it a point to take good care of myself. I have to with my nature. Well, uh, if it's in your nature to fight the way you did those subway doors tonight, I think I see what you mean. You, uh, you have this tendency to throw yourself into things. At last, a woman who understands me. <laughs> a 
Oh, you're so pretty when you laugh. Oh, thank you. Um, Tom, what did you mean before about not realizing how much you needed to see Jack and Mary? Well, tonight was very special. It was the first time I really had a sense of the belonging together. That bond that you and May were so sure of, but I never was. I sort of took it in faith that Mary should go back with him. Now, I helped make it happen because I knew it was what she wanted, not because I thought it was right. Of course, it was obvious at the wedding that they were happy, but the real test comes when the excitement's over, doesn't it? And seeing them settle in their home, I understood it is right. And suddenly, I'm very pleased with all of us. Does that make any sense to you? Yes. I'm over her faith. Oh, I hope they love each other for the rest of their lives, and I hope Mary will always be my dear friend. But beyond that, the pain's gone, the wound's healed. You think I'm mad? No, no. I, I've just never seen anyone get over a broken heart in the course of one evening, right before my very eyes. The pain is gone and the wound is healed. As of uh, 8 p.m. on January the 27th. That stuns me. Now, I bet if you saw Pat truly happy with Delia, something similar would happen to you, too. Well, that's an interesting point. Which you don't want to discuss. Um, I think we can probably find something more interesting to talk about. Shall I tell you about the desperate crush I had on the most beautiful third grade teacher in Ireland and the moment I realized I was over it? Third grade? Oh, she wasn't my first love either. You see, I tend to, um, throw myself into <laughs> things. You had a perfectly brilliant insight about me. All or nothing. Oh, no halfway measures. Lord, it's a terrible way to be sometimes. The trouble I've fallen into. Tell me about that. Tom O'Brien Desmond, are you never coming home? Why don't I take Edmund inside and, and rock with him for a while? Uh, do you really have the time? Sure. Oh. <laughs> Good night, Pumpkin. Tomorrow, we're going to get up nice and early and take a nice long walk in the park. Oh, you're such a sweet boy. <laughs> Thanks, Miriam. Why are you here? Uh. I had a late meeting, and I decided I might as well stop by, pick up the rest of my stuff on the way home. Oh. Miriam, uh, didn't wake Edmund for you. No, no, I... I wouldn't ask you to do that. But you did spend some time with him. Yeah, about two minutes. Seneca, that is so unfair. One of the reasons I asked you to move out was so... Edmund would get used to living without you. Now, you're not his father, and you are not my husband. But he has come to expect you here all the time. Now, that has to be undone. Now, I'm asking you please not to come here when Miriam is taking care of him. It puts her in an awful position, too. I thought he'd be asleep. I see. Well, there are your suitcases. Good night. You're not ready to talk. About what? If you're asking me if I changed my mind, the answer is no. No, that isn't what I was going to ask. Well, you certainly didn't come here at this hour to get your suitcases, and if it has nothing to do with Edmund and nothing to do with me, then what is it? Have you told Frank yet? No. But you're still planning to. Frank will know that Edmund is his son. As soon as I get a chance to talk to him by myself. Now, I went by his office tonight. He was there with Ray Woodard. Now, I really wasn't up to having a threesome. So I left, but I will go back. 
I know what that feels like, you know. Get all psyched up to tell the truth, and then you, you lose your chance or your nerve, whatever. I must have tried to tell you 50 times that Edmund couldn't be my child. But something always got in the way. I guess I wanted it to. You were upset or tired, usually reasons that revolved around Frank, or, or you're happy sitting there with Edmund and me. Had all the words in my head, but uh, I just couldn't begin. Yeah, well, I, I know what it feels like to be on the other side. Maybe that's one of the reasons I'm not screaming for you to get out of here. I lied to Frank for a long time, and it was very painful. But it was wrong. And dishonest. And I'm not going to allow that to happen again to him or to me. Fine. But if the opportune moment... Seneca, I am not waiting for the opportune moment. I just want a chance to talk to him alone. When you get Frank alone, I'd appreciate knowing what happens. You mean you hope that I won't be able to do it? Hello? Georgia, hello. This is Jill. Why, for heaven's sakes, how are you? You working late, too? No, no, actually, I'm, I'm home. Look, is something important going on there? Well, moderately important. Mr. Ryan has a few things that need to go out first thing tomorrow. You know, same old story. Yeah, it sounds like it. Is he there? Not yet, but I expect him very soon. Uh, well, look, I have something important to talk to him about. Do you think I, I could come over there now? Well, I'm going home, but you know where the key is. Yeah, by the fire extinguisher. That's right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. If you must work at such an ungodly hour, at least let me fortify you against the cold. No more for me. It'll warm you up. It'll put me to sleep. Would that be so bad? And think paper anywhere else. All of your favorite. <laughs> oh, that was a wonderful story. <laughs> oh, now tell me another adventure. <sighs> Were you ever involved in the uh, the troubles? Uh, politics. Yeah. Yes, briefly when I was sixteen. Was it anything dangerous? Yes. Now it's another broad comedy, depending on your point of view. Now, I was very friendly with a group of lads who got up a kind of platoon, but the fact is there's little more for them to do but to plan and talk because there was no real fighting going on. So they started having drills at night, you see, practice raids and so forth. Like war games? Right. Now, my father told me he'd cut off both my ears if I joined them. <laughs> well, he was afraid I'd end up doing something rash or it might cost him his job, dreadful and all as it was. Now, nevertheless, I was approached one night. Now, I couldn't very well say no. The lads were out to take a warehouse which was supposed to be full of lorries and jeeps. Now, it was about half a mile down the river, and I had access to a boat, you see. Ah, so you joined in the game. Ah, but this was a real mission. How real? Guns? Well, I was given a very old, very large shotgun, uh, something like a shovel, only a good deal heavier. Oh, so you didn't actually use any uh, guns. I uh, know, wait now. The plan was for me to take the five lads down river, beach the boat out of sight, stay with it till one of two things happened. Either the five would successfully drive off in five British lorries, whereupon I would depart silently, or else they would unsuccessfully return to the boat, whereupon I'd row like blue blazes. You mean you were supposed to get all of them out? With lightning speed, if necessary. Oh, they were lads of great faith. Is that the plan you stuck with? We tried. 
I got them to the factory. They waded into shore, disappeared into the night. Now, I began to row close enough to land the boat. When a screaming siren went off, lights flashed, voices blazed. So I grabbed my gun, hopped out of the boat. Oh, Tom. Well, I was the only one in a position to be able to take cover and fire. Then I realized the boat was drifting off. So I made a frantic dash through the water, which was up to my waist, and jumped back in again. Only to discover the oars were gone. They bounced out of their locks when I jumped. So there I was, paddling with my hands, frantically drifting further out every second. Meanwhile, the siren is wailing, and voices are shouting. And what did you do? Well, a stroke of genius. I used the shotgun to pull the boat back to shore. Then I hopped back into the boat. And I drifted in a little further. Then I got out of the boat again. Oh, only to discover that I could hear them coming. Now, I stood in the mud, yeah. rifle to my shoulder, and thought, at least if I can get one good shot, I can save our honor. And I could hear them coming. And I almost got trampled to death by my own comrades. They came thundering by, practically flew into the boat, and almost took off without me. But you didn't have any oars. Well, thank God, at least I had a chance to catch up with them. So we set to, to, to rowing with our rifle butts and made damn good progress. And nobody followed us. We had tripped an alarm, and the only one there was the watchman. <laughs> and I'm sure he hid. And the voices I'd heard were ours. <laughs> well, that makes an hysterical story, <laughs> but I'm sure you were terrified at the time. Well, I was, and uh, even more so when we got safe back into town and we were getting our story straight before we went home. Now, I told the lads I'd almost taken a shot. And my friend Vincent, who was inspecting the weapons, <laughs> looked at me and said, you weren't going to fire this thing. I was, I said. Well, he turned white as a sheet, raised up the barrel of the gun for me to look at. It was crammed with sand that had turned hard as a rock. And if you fired? The barrel would have blown up, and me along with it. So, from that day on, I vowed to stay as far away from firearms as possible for the rest of my life. Thank you for tonight. Thank you. Oh, it was a privilege. I think we're saying good night. I think it's about that time. Will Georgia be waiting for you? I hope not. So, what happens? You go to the office, read your letters, and then? And then sign them and go on home. Early session tomorrow? No. Let me tell you. Let me give you some more brandy. I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> you know, Bill is dead and I'm alive. And that's a very hard thing for me to understand. But I'm starting to, because of you and your family. You reached out to me. How did you know I needed that? Everybody needs it. We can all take a certain amount of loneliness. Oh, tremendous amount. But sooner or later, there's a need for... For comfort. Someone who'll care and listen. Yes. Well, uh, it's been a long 
long day. Will you try and get some rest? Good idea. Well, I think we can say we have successfully completed the first step of your campaign. For whichever house. <laughs> I'll make up my mind about the Senate as soon as I can. Good night. Good night. Sorry to come by so late. Oh, uh, well, that's okay. Is there anything wrong? Uh, yeah. Um, you're not expecting anybody, are you? No. Well, that's good. Because I, uh, I need to talk to you. It's terribly important. in for a night of drama featuring the biggest stars from your favorite TV shows and movies. It's your night for a great film with the Sunday Night Movies, every Sunday night at 10 on SoapNet.